we, uh, we appreciate everybody coming onto this call. Um, it's a very uh, important, um, and we're, we're very thankful to Debbie for addressing this. Um, we are, uh, I am part of the organization Pathways, and we're, we're sponsoring this together with the helpline uh, from Manchester, Rabbi Goldman. Um, and Debbie has been extremely helpful in setting up this very helpful service for the, the entire UK. And um, she's, she helped set it up, she's managing it, she's continu continually supervising and training. And uh, we, we, we appreciate and we very much value the uh, opportunity to invite um, everyone on, onto this call. And this, we, we've asked Debbie to, to address how can we speak to our children about this? Um, and I know, I know this, it's our topic this evening, but, but at the same time, I think we've all ourselves, like before we can speak to our children, I think we have to process this for ourselves. Um, so a, a, alongside of how to speak to our, our, our children, um, if I could ask Debbie also to, how, how do we speak to ourselves? How do we understand this ourselves? Because I think it's, it's invoked difficult things in, in all of us, how to understand this. Um, and without much further ado, I'd like to hand this over to Debbie. Uh, hey, why did you want to say something or? No, I'm thinking uh, we're good. We're good. Malach said everything. I think we're good for we're, we're here okay. to hear you. Okay, so Erev Tov, it's good to see all of you. And I invite any of you who feel comfortable to open your videos because I think seeing one another helps a lot, especially when we're going to be talking about things like this. So first of all, I would love to just stand here and tell you that there is no abuse in our community and that we can all just breathe in and breathe out and not worry and our firm community and our children are safe. But I think the reason we're all here is we realize that that isn't the case, that abuse happens in every community and abuse happens in the firm communities as well even from special communities like the communities that you all come from. Now, I, I travel all over the world and now with Zoom, I get to speak to people all over the world. And often I feel like the prophet of doom because I go from place to place and I keep telling communities, you have to safeguard your children. You have to make serious changes. And people don't really wanna hear that or they'll hear it and then they'll go back to their regular life because that's what's convenient. And what we're gonna to try to do today is maybe talk about the little things that we can do, how we can talk to our children, how we can make our homes safer, how we can make our communities safer. Now we're gonna focus on three things this evening and we're even gonna have a segment where some of you who want can even express feelings. So first we're gonna talk about how do we protect our children? How do we give our children safeguarding skills? And then we're gonna talk, how do we even speak about such a horrific event to our children who may have heard it in the neighborhood or from friends? So how do we know what they heard and how do we put it all back together for our kids? And then finally, we're gonna talk about a little bit about ourselves. How do we move back to a place of hope and a place of believing again in the world after such a catastrophe. I, um, I really feel we all went through some form of tsunami, some big gigantic storm that has swept us all off our feet. And um, for many people, this is really earth shattering and they don't know how to rebuild their lives. And other people who have been victimized in the past feel this brings them all back to any abuse that they went to. So we're seeing so many different fragments in our community who are affected by this. Um, now, we can talk to our children about safeguarding. In Hebrew, we call it muganut. In English, I know in England, you call it safeguarding. And we can talk to our children about safeguarding. I mean, think about it. The same way that we teach our kids to cross the street and we teach them road safety skills and by the time they're six or seven, they do that without intense fear. And yet we have this fear that if we talk to them about safeguarding, we might be opening up Pandora's box. And that really isn't true. 
because it can be part of our chinuch and it can be done in such an appropriate way from a young age. We can talk in a way that is with sneers, a way that is gentle, and a way that gives them skills without opening up anything that can be problematic. First of all, let's talk for one minute. Why do we have this epidemic? Um, now, I'm calling it an epidemic, and I've been calling it an epidemic for the past 10 years. So it's not just because of the COVID-19. Um, and, and you're seeing it because we finally come out from under from one story and another story comes up. Why do we have this problem today? Now, first of all, people always ask me, is it really happening more today or is there more awareness? Is it really happening more today or are we more willing to deal with it and talk about it? And the answer is yes and yes and yes. Yes, it's happening more today. Yes, we're willing to deal with it more. And yes, we're willing to talk about it more. Why is it happening more today? Well, I think it's obvious to a lot of us that one of the biggest problems that faces our world is the media and the internet. And the tuma in the internet is unbelievable. For a very little amount of money, usually about $100, a young teen can buy a tablet this size with unlimited exposure to horrible things. Now, one of the things that they have found is that 85% of the inappropriate, unsneeze stuff on the internet have violence in it as well. So these kids are being overwhelmed and overpowered with violence, aggression, and inappropriate, unsneeze stuff. And this is going in and affecting. Another reason we have an epidemic is studies have shown that little boys who are abused and don't get help can sometimes go out and abuse. And certainly 10, 15 years ago, boys did not come forward and say, something happened to me, I need help. And so we're seeing a generation of perpetrators as well. So we have a lot of reasons of why it is coming out today. And also we know that we're living in a door, we're living in a generation, hopefully, right before Mashiach comes, but we're living in a generation with a lot of nisyanos, a lot of trials and tribulations that we have to go through. And we have to go through them in the right way as people, as families, and as communities. And that's one of the things that I'd like to stress tonight, and we'll talk more about it later, that we need a community reaction. Now, Manchester really has done that. They've opened up a helpline. They've had the teachers trained in safeguarding. And in London, Schmacko Lee has trained many, many, many schools and programs. But we have to think how every community can do that so that we can keep our children safer. Now, if we talk a little bit about the statistics, 97% of the perpetrators are men or young men or boys. Now, sometimes people say that's not accurate we are hesitant to talk about women who perpetrate. But usually if you even mention women as perpetrator, it's 5% of the time, 7%. We're still talking about most of the time, the abusers are men. And that's important because when we're gonna talk about keeping our kids safe, we're going to have to use that statistic. The second statistic is that 85 to 90% of the time, the abuser is someone the child knows, someone the child recognizes. Now, if I would have come to talk to you about 15 years ago, I would have said to you that 60% of the time, the abuser is someone the child knows, and 40% of the time, the abuser is a stranger. Today, I'm telling you 85 to 90% of the time, it's someone the child knows. But this is interesting. Why did these statistics change? They changed because of you and me. What did we do that changed the statistic? For the past 15 years, we have taught our children stranger danger. Stranger danger, stranger danger, stranger danger. Don't go with a stranger. Don't open your door to a stranger. Don't get in a car with a stranger. Don't take a gift from a stranger. And it worked. 
our kids heard that message. So basically what happened is that changed the statistics because the perpetrators now either had to abuse children they knew or they had to develop, groom the child so that they were no longer a stranger so that it would work. Now, I'm not saying this is wonderful news, but what I'm saying is it just shows that we can make changes, that we can talk to our kids in a way that will make them understand the message. Okay, so as a mother, and I see, I don't see men, too many men, so I'm going to address this to the mothers basically, but as a mother, when do you start talking about this with your child? Or as a father, we recommend from the age of three. From the age of three, you put safeguarding into your lifestyle, into your home, into your everyday conversations with your child. And it can be done so smoothly and so easily. And therefore, the child doesn't see this as something threatening. The child sees this as just one more part of their chinuch, one more part of what they learned from mommy and daddy, from Abba and Ima. An example could be, you go with your child to the bakery and the bakery woman offers your child a cookie for free. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I was a little girl, my father, Zichrono Lebracha, used to take me to a bakery. It was called Snowflake Bakery in Syracuse, New York. And he would take me every Sunday and I would smile real sweetly and look real innocent, hoping that that woman would offer me one of those cookies with the all different color sparkles because my father didn't think those were the kind of cookies you should buy. And, and, and she always offered me a cookie. So now when you take your child to the local supermarket, local Macaulay, to the bakery, and this nice woman or nice man offers your child a sweet or a cookie, what you say is, Yossi, you can take the cookie from Mr. Cohen because mommy is here. But if mommy's not here, you can't take the cookie. A very tiny message, a tiny message that we only take gifts, we only take things when mommy's around. Now that's not frightening to a child. It's just something that they can learn very gently. So as the child gets older, we add more and more and more parts to the safeguarding conversation. Now we like to teach kids that they have a magic pocket. And what we do is we tell the children, everybody has a magic pocket. And wherever you go, you can take that magic pocket with you. And often we'll have the kids pat around and find where is their magic pocket until you'll have one little girl who might say, I can't find my magic pocket. And you'll remind her, it's just imaginary, but it's a magic pocket that's yours and that you can take everywhere. And what do we have in our magic pocket? The three safety skills. In Hebrew, we call them shloshita lamedim, the three lamids, because the safety skills start with a letter lamid. And in English, we say the three safety rules or the three safety skills. And what are our three safety skills? Say no, run away, tell your mommy. Say no, run away, tell your mommy. And we teach them that wherever you go, these three safety skills are in your pocket. What does that mean? The first skill is if anyone comes over to you or anyone asks you something or anyone wants you to do something, you say no and then you run away and then you go tell mommy or daddy or an adult that you trust. Say no, run away, tell your mommy. And we, throughout the day and throughout the month and throughout the week, we can come up with examples of when they could use their safety skills. We even have hand signals, say no, run away, tell your mommy. Say no, run away, tell your mommy. And the kids can learn these skills very easily. So if your child comes home and tells you a story, you can say, oh, that would have been a great case to use your magic pocket. Even if it's with someone they know, you're going to reinforce 
using the three safety skills. And you're going to do it with lots of different examples in their everyday life. The next thing we're going to teach our kids is the biggest rule of all. Everything you do, everything you do needs mommy or daddy's permission. You don't go anywhere without mommy's permission. You don't do a mitzvah or a chesed or a good deed for someone without daddy's permission. And this is really important. And it's really a dilemma because on one hand, we're mechanech our children to do mitzvahs, to do chesed, to do good things for other people. But unfortunately, because of the situation today, we have to add something else to that chinuch. We have to add that everything you do is with mommy and daddy's permission. Now, I grew up in a small town where everybody knew everybody, and yet it never entered my head to go to the neighbor without my mother's permission. That was very drummed into children long, long time ago when I was a child. But today there's this freedom that kids can go places without telling their mommies. And we have to change that. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you first need your mommy or your daddy's permission. And this is really important. The neighbor, the good neighbor that we all really like, asks your eight-year-old son if he could help him if he could help him, if you could come into the house and help him because he has something on a high shelf and he needs help taking it down. And your son's reaction should be, I would love to help you, Mr. Cohen. First, I have to get my mother's permission. Now, why is that so important? I'm sure Mr. Cohen's a wonderful man. We're not judging Mr. Cohen at all. But why it's so important is because the second the perpetrator knows that this is a child whose mother knows where they are every second of the day. This is a child who asks their mother's permission for everything. They will think twice about approaching that child because one of the most important things to understand is abusers don't act on the spot. They plan it. They plan it so they don't get caught. And they also zero in on children who are lonely or zero in on children who don't have parents who know where they are. So we're going to teach our children that everything you do and everywhere you go, you need mommy or daddy's permission. We're gonna to talk to our kids about good secrets and bad secrets. And you've heard this over and over again. What is a good secret? A good secret is something that makes you feel good. And something else about a good secret eventually it's not going to be a secret. So a good secret could be that on Sunday we're having a surprise birthday party for Bubby and all our cousins are coming. And when the child thinks about that secret, they have a nice feeling. They're excited. Maybe there'll be ice cream, maybe they're balloons. Who knows what's going to be at this party? But also the child understands that on Monday, it's already not going to be a secret. Good secrets are time limited. Good secrets come out. And how do we explain a bad secret to a child? If anyone tells you anything, or anyone shows you anything, or anyone does anything to you, or anyone asks you to do anything, that gives you a tiny, queasy feeling in your stomach. And they tell you, shh, don't tell. That's a sign it's a bad secret and you have to right away run and tell a responsible adult. So what is a bad secret? If anyone tells you anything, if anyone shows you anything, if anyone asks you anything, or anyone asks you to do anything, and they say, shh, don't tell, and it gives you this tiny, icky little feeling in your stomach, that's a sign it's a bad secret, and you have to right away tell an adult whether it's your mommy or your daddy or your best friend's mommy or your grandma, or your grandma or your tati, you have to tell right away because bad secrets should never be kept. And you can even talk to your kids about if they're feeling sad or if something's bothering them, who are the adults in their life that they can talk to so they can realize that 
there are people in their life who they can tell these things to. And one of the final things we're gonna to talk to our children about from the age of three is their private parts. And whether or not you wanna give a name to private parts or not, that is really your decision. But we have to talk to our children about private parts. And what we recommend is telling them that your private parts are the parts that your bathing suit covers. And no one should touch your private parts or ask you to touch theirs. No one should show you their private parts or ask you to show you theirs. And if they do, you have to say no, run away and tell your mommy. Now, when I give the lecture, sometimes they say, well, look at Debbie, you can't imagine how much of the body our baby bathing suits cover. And I say even better, more places that they learn nobody should touch or nobody should show. So it doesn't really matter what your bathing suit looks like. That's a very easy and sneeze way to talk to your children about private parts. And we should talk to it from the age of three. We also have to teach our children sneeze. What does that mean? That I'm a big believer in buying every kid a Terry bathrobe. And kids should learn when they go to the shower, when they go to the bath, they have a robe to wear. So that also one another, between one another, there's this feeling that this is a private part, this is my body, and nobody has a right to ask to see it or to touch it. Now, these are all things that we have to think, how can we put it into our everyday lives with our children? What would work? What are the scenarios? How do we build a safe home environment? Well, first of all, teaching the children they don't open the door ever to anybody when mommy or daddy aren't home. Not to their relatives, not to friends, not to neighbors. Children do not open the door when mommy and daddy aren't home. And that's really important. And when you get home and you find out that somebody really important had come and they didn't open the door and you're a little frustrated, you're gonna smile and say, wow, Shlomi, you used your safeguarding skills, wonderful. Because it's really important. We don't open the door to stuck up people when mommy and daddy are not home. And we certainly don't let anybody in the house. Now, one of the dilemmas is we want our kids to feel comfortable with their family members and their extended family members, but we also have to teach them all of these rules apply to people in the family. They apply to people in the extended family as well. Now, I once gave a, a course um, and the course was all week. We had a break for Shabbat and we came back on Sunday. And one of the men came back on Sunday and he said, this was a Shabbos bar mitzvah for my nephew. And all of the mishpacha came from all over and we all went to this hotel together. And suddenly all I could hear was your voice in my ear saying, these rules have to apply even in the family. So he said, before we left the house, I told the children that we're going to a hotel and that nobody is to go into their rooms. Nobody, not their cousins, not their friends can go into their bedrooms and that they can't go anywhere in the hotel without mommy or daddy's permission. And he explained these rules to the kids. And then in the middle of the Shabbos Friday night table, he stood up and he told the entire extended mishpacha, this is what I told my children. And I want everybody to tell their children the same. So in other words, we can teach our children these are rules. It doesn't mean the people are dangerous or bad. It's just safety rules and we keep the safety rules. The same way we keep safety rules when we cross the street, we keep safeguarding rules wherever we go. And the children can learn this. We get calls to our helpline from kids where they, they will call and they will tell us how they use their safety skills. And there's nothing nicer than getting these phone calls. We had one little third, year, third grade girl who called us up and she said, 
I just want you to know I did A, B, C, D, and it really worked. So we can make these fun things as part of their everyday growing up. So how do we help them deal with the latest issue? Well, first of all, when we're dealing with the issue concerning high and Balder, first of all, it's important to find out what your child heard. You know, did they hear anything at all? Well, obviously the 12 year old or the 15 year old might've heard more than a four year old, but you can really just sit with them and say, you know, have you been talking with your friends about anything? Has anything come up? To first try to see, did they hear anything? What did they hear? So that you can first know what you have to correct because often children will hear things from other children that are so distorted and so have nothing to do with what went on. So how do we talk about it? Look at when we start talking about safeguarding with children, the first message we give the children is most of the people are good. Most of the Yidden are good. Most of the people in our neighborhood are good. Most of the people in our shul are good. But maybe there's one person who isn't nice inside. Maybe there's one person who doesn't know how to kovashis yetzerhara. Maybe there's one person who doesn't know the difference between good or bad. That's why we have safety skills, because we don't know who that person is. It's not like we can look inside them and see, are they good or are they bad? With a lot of times with kids, we bring them apples and we show them two apples. And one apple is beautiful and red and shiny. And the other apple has lots of bumps on the outside. And we can take a knife and show them if we cut one apple, the pretty one inside it might be brown and even have a worm. And if we cut the one with the bumps, it might be fine inside. We can't know from the outside. And that's why we use our safety skills. So first of all, if they heard the story, you can say to them, yes, it's very upsetting. It's very upsetting to not know who's a good person and who's not a good person. But you can feel a little bit more sure because you have your safeguarding skills. And also you can always, if you're not sure about somebody, you can always come talk to me or mommy about this. So with little kids, we can just put it back into the fact that most people are good and we have safety skills. As kids get older, they're gonna have more questions. And each of us as a parent, first of all, trust your parenting skills. You've been parents, you've been good parents for a long time. So you know your children. And really what you have to do is allay their fears. There are good people in this world. We do live in a good community. We do live in a Torah community that has so many good, good people who follow the laws and follow the halachas and do all the mitzvahs that they should be doing. But sometimes there are people who have problems and who don't. And that's why it's so important that you follow your safeguarding rules. Now, if you see your child is really upset and we might see that with the young teenagers, you might even have to really open up and talk to them more at their level about it and explain to them more about it. Every child though, in the way that is appropriate for them, every child in a way that works for them. Before, I give you time to talk as well and express and hear some of your questions. Let's talk a little bit about how this affected us. We all went through a crisis. Now, what is a crisis? A crisis is when literally somebody pulls the rug out from under us. A crisis is an event that shatters our assumptions about life and about the people in our life. And one of the biggest assumptions is that we live in a meaningful, orderly, organized world and we can understand it. And our world has logic 
and seder to it. And as from Jews, we believe that. We believe that if we follow the halachas and we live in this, this good community, we will meet good people and we will know who the good people are. And then something like this happens. And it makes us, as mothers, as grandmothers, as great man mothers, start to wonder. I mean, how could I have thought this person was so good? And look at what he did. It's really really devastating. So first of all, that is exactly what happens in a crisis. Your assumption is shattered. Another assumption we all have is that we're going to be okay, that we and our families are invulnerable. Now, of course, we know ad me ab until 120, but today we're going to be okay. Now, how can I prove to you that we all have this assumption? that we all have an assumption that we're a little bit invulnerable, that we're gonna be okay. Well, one of the ways to prove to you is you're here tonight. Because I promise you, if you actually thought today was your last day on the world, you would not be coming and listening to this soon. There's a feeling that I can do the laundry and I can do the shopping and I can do all these other things because I have tomorrow also. And then something like this happens that makes you wonder about your children's vulnerability, about your family's vulnerability, and that shatters another assumption. So how do we rebuild these assumptions? A, we breathe in and we breathe out. We take time to realize what they did to us, what these events did to us. We take time to just digest them. And then of course, what we have to do is rebuild ourselves. We have to rebuild ourselves. And one of the best ways to rebuild our belief in the world is to put chesed back in the world. I really believe the only way to combat evil is to put chesed in the world. There's nothing stronger than that. We've all confronted evil. And that's really hard. When you confront evil, it, it like, it touches in a shama. You don't know how to move on. But one of the ways to combat evil or deal with it is to put chesed back in the world. So to think, what can you do to make the world a better place? That's a way to start building your assumptions. We're going through a lot of nisyanos, but we can grow from them. Our families can grow. Our communities can grow. We can grow from them. All of this is almost like a car seat. Think about it. I don't know the statistics in England, but in Israel, we have a horrible rate of car accidents and people who die and people who are hurt in car accidents. And yet every one of us get out and get into a car and every one of us put our children in cars. Now think of that. On one hand, we shouldn't even go near a car if we see all these statistics and we do it automatically. And how do we do it? With our safety skills. We read about what is the safest car seat. And we go out and get that safest car seat. And then we put it in our car and we learn how do you buckle the stupid thing in, which for some of us is not as easy as for the younger ones. And then we put our child or grandchild into that car seat. And then we can go. Why? Because we feel that we did our basic safety stuff. And then the rest we can put by a daim shalakadosh baruch into God's hands. So one of the way we deal with all of these statistics that we hear is we figure out how can we make our little world safe again and then we can go back out there and then we can go back with our assumptions. So safeguarding skills is similar to a car seat. You're gonna give these skills to the children. You're gonna enact the skills within your home. And there's many ways to do that. If you have a lot of orchim, you have a lot of guests, explaining to them, they can be in the kitchen, they can be in the living room, they can be in their room, they can't go into other rooms. In other words, staying up and until they all go back to their rooms, thinking how even when we do the mitzvah of hachnasas orchim, we can keep safeguarding in our house.
Okay, I'm going to stop a minute to allow some of you to express how all of this has affected you or to ask any questions that you might have. Is there any, anybody who'd like to say something or express something or ask something? May I ask something? Okay, it says B.D. Lang, yes. Yeah, I just want to ask you, when you're saying that children shouldn't open the door when mommy and daddy are not there, what age are you talking about? I mean, teenagers, are they not allowed to open the door if the parents aren't there? Uh, let's talk about first about babysitters. Okay, certainly babysitters should be told that when they're babysitting, they don't open the door to anyone, not even a family relative of the people they are babysitting for. Um, in your own homes, I would certainly say if there aren't two teenagers who are there together, then the teenager shouldn't open the door. Thank you. And these are, not oh, yes, easy things to, these are not easy things to tell your teenagers, but if they start to understand that you're serious, then now an, another thing about these rules is, let's say they do open the door, but they're opening the door with their magic pocket because the second they open the door, there's a part of them that is remembering they're not supposed to. And as they remember they're not supposed to, already they have an awareness. And that awareness will allow them to take out the three safety skills much quicker. Thank you so much for hosting this, Debbie. I wanted to ask you, we seem to be um, trying to empower children, which is so important. And everything you're saying is so valuable. I'm going to be covering these things with my children again. Um, but my question is regarding the overall culture of teaching safety skills to children and I'm just worried about how about holding staff members and schools accountable and conducting safety checks, screening employees for um, all the schools. And this is something that I feel like is the other side of the coin that really has to be addressed more also. Okay, yes, I was going to get to that. So I'll address it now just because you asked, okay? Um, we're going to talk in the next step about how do we build a safe community? Okay, and building a safe community means that every single one of us has to make sure that our community is now safe for our children. And how do we do that? First of all, are the teachers screened? Are the teachers screened and background checked before they're teaching our children? In Israel, we have a law that all men teachers have to bring um, a certificate from the police saying there have never been cases against them. But are we checking in with the schools they worked in in the past and are we asking the right questions? Second of all, every school, every synagogue, every workplace should have protocols of safeguarding. And we should go and find out, do they have protocols? And if they do, they're welcome to send them to Tehal and we will check them over for free and give our opinion about their safeguards, safeguarding protocols. Third thing, is every institution should have a monitor who is trained and knows how to make sure that these protocols are put in place. And that's something that we also do. We train monitors all over the world for these things. The fourth thing is you wanna make sure that, that the community has an awareness and that the community is taking these things seriously. So if you see something inappropriate going on in your community, find a Rav or find somebody in the community and talk about it and tell them, we certainly need community, community awareness. Now community awareness is many steps. We need workshops for the parents. We need workshops for the teachers. We need workshops for the children. We need all different parts so that there is total awareness. I mean, look at they did with the COVID. Within one week, they suddenly taught us about masks and about, don't you remember at the beginning, they didn't teach us masks. First, they taught us gloves, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so if we can talk about this so open wide in all different communities, we certainly can talk about safeguarding and make sure. So yes, you are right. 
we have a responsibility to make sure that our community is responsive. Now here you have this evening is sponsored by two organizations within the Manchester community, the Helpline and Pathways. And you could certainly contact them to think, how do we build our community? And I know that I've been approached by someone in Harnof who wants to think, how do we build a special program from Harnof? So this can be done, certainly. Other Hi, questions? Uh, yes, um, says Jackie Lowenstein. Yes. Yeah, hi. Hello. Yes. Thank you so much for this class. I wanted to ask, um, is there any way to prepare children for um, staying over at someone's house, even like a family member, if I'm going away? Okay, sure. Certainly. First of all, if a child is going to stay at a friend's house for the night, call the parent and find out if they're going to be home. If they're not home, then maybe it's not the right night for your child to be there. If they're going to a chasana, that isn't the right night for your child to sleep over. Second of all, when your child goes, remind them of their safety skills. And if anything doesn't feel well, they can always just call you and you will come. And the third thing is make sure that they're going to be sleeping in separate beds. Often when kids sleep over, they share beds. And that is just a situation that could lead to problems. And the fourth thing is when your child comes home the next day, don't be folding the laundry or doing the dishes. Greet your child at the door, sit down with them, maybe give them a cookie and something to drink and say, how did it go? How was it? So if there was anything inappropriate or uncomfortable, you are offering them the opportunity now to talk about it. And the last thing is call them. Call them before they go to bed. How's it going? How are you doing? And if you hear something in their voice that just doesn't feel comfortable, then say, you know, I think I'm going to come pick you up. And those are ways that also if a child is reminded of their safety skills when they're going out, they're more apt to be able to use them. Hi there, Mrs. Gross. Yes. Hi, thank you so much uh, for coming on and speaking to us. I wanted to ask, um, I understand that we can create a culture of educating our children on this and making it a, a normal culture that we can, like, like we talk about uh, crossing the road, safety crossing the road, so too uh, with this. The only difference is that this is about people. And I want to know, how can we co constantly educate our children about this, but at the same time not create this extremely paranoid and nervous and negative connotation to every person we're around without cre creating that culture at the same time. Okay, so let me answer, let me answer that question. We've been doing, to hell, we've been doing our workshops for 30 years. We have never had one parent or one teacher come back to us and say, the children left fearful, the children left paranoid, the children left afraid of people. That isn't the way it's done. It's done through your everyday conversation. It's gone, I'll give you an example. My, um, my husband was in show with the two little boy grandsons before the corona. And um, he, he, was, um, he was sitting next to the other grandfather. And one of the little boys said to the other grandfather, he has to go to the bathroom. And the other grandfather said, no problem. You know where it is, go ahead. And all of a sudden my husband stopped and says, oh no. Debbie will kill me if I send him to the bathroom. And he went and escorted the little boy to the bathroom. In other words, teaching, also teaching our spouses that in shul, when a little grandchild has to go to the bathroom, you have to escort them. And making children understand that if you have to go to the bathroom, you have to ask your Zadie's permission. You have to tell them where you are at all times. It doesn't scare them when it's a normal part of every day. We are not teaching them to be afraid of the community. We are empowering them to have skills to prevent if anybody in the community isn't appropriate. There's a big difference. I honestly believe most of the people in the community are good. And you know, I brought my kids up like this and I certainly can say, if anything, they, they could have been more paranoid. They certainly didn't stop them from being friendly, but you had to follow the rules. And um, these, and with, with preteens, it's really hard. Um, 
when they when my son was 11 and he wants to go to the basketball game with friends so I said that they could go by bus together as a group but then coming back what somebody a neighbor offered all the boys a ride and my friend knew if he got into that ride he was my son knew he was never going to another game again in other words letting them understand how they go and how they come home they've discussed with you and they have to follow the rules May I ask in continuation to the previous question, how sure. often would you talk to your kids about it um, in order to not cause, as spoken before, paranoia or such? Okay, well, it's not like I'm having a talk with them. It's part of every day. It's just part of something. Uh, uh, a while ago, I was sitting on the couch on Shabbat. And one of my grandsons said something to the other grandson. And I said, well, you know, everything you do, you have to ask your mommy's permission. And I went back to reading my book. Well, months later in his a nursery, the nursery teacher was teaching them about Eliezer and Rivka. And the nursery teacher took out a paper and wrote down, and she asked each of the little boys, who would go with Eliezer? And every single of the boys said he would go with Eliezer, except my grandson. He said, I would go with them, but first I have to ask my mommy's permission. That was one comment that was just said very nonchalantly on Shabbat, okay? We are not saying sit your kids down and make them scared. What we're saying is everyday conversations. I gave an example of that Shabbos bar mitzvah. That man and his kids had a wonderful time, but the kids knew that nobody came into their bedrooms and they couldn't go into anyone else's bedroom. And they had daddy and mommy had to know where they were at every time. That doesn't stop them from having a wonderful weekend. Those are just rules that we put in place. Thank you. Abby, we've had a couple of questions in about when speaking to, when parents have spoken to their young children about safety, they've asked about what this place is about help on the toilet in GAN or in kindergarten. Is a teacher allowed to wipe them? I've had a couple of questions in about how it works. Look, I think that's really the case where, first of all, you have to make sure that the nursery teacher or the who's who's ever taking care of the young children that they've gotten a lecture on safeguarding. Okay, because once they've gotten a lecture, already there's a feeling that they're going to be more more aware. They're going to be more careful. Now, if on the depending on the child's age and how much help they need. But again, somebody, the administration has to explain to them what is appropriate and what isn't. And obviously that area should be an eye. It shouldn't be a back area where other people, the, the assistant can see what's going on, et cetera. Also, if you don't Debbie. feel comfortable with somebody, then talk to them about how you would like things to be with your child. You know, um, one of the things we talked about is that most of the perpetrators are men. What does that mean? That means that if you're gonna have a tutor for your child, the tutor should be in your home or you should go to the home and sit there, but you don't just send your child to a tutor to a, a man's home without knowing that, that somebody is watching what's going on. So we have to really think about these things. Um, my, my little granddaughter wanted a guitar for her birthday. So I took her shopping for her birthday and a month later I asked her, did you start lessons yet? She says, well, I almost started, but then the guitar teacher was a man and my, uh, my Abba says, no, 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 it has to be a woman guitar teacher and it has to be in our home. So little things like that can make the difference. Debbie, so, um... yes. I really am excited that these um, topics are addressed um, so well. Um, I know this is a whole nother subject, but I just feel it's so um, important. I'm not sure if you address it. It's um, not only reducing the risk of victims, um, but reducing the risks of developing abusers um, in terms of the big subject of porn and um, exposure. And I don't know if people here are aware of statistically how, how many boys and are exposed to it, even if they have a kosher phone, like in school, and that it really needs education in the home. 
um, that these things exist and that the damage of porn and um, that, that they can have an open conversation about it. Okay, so how do we talk to our kids? Even if you have no computer, even if you don't have a smartphone, even if you have no internet, you have to talk to your kids about safety with computers. And you have to explain to them that there's computers allow people to see things that may not be appropriate or that may not be sneeze or that may not be right. And that's why you don't look at someone's computer without mommy's permission. You don't look at someone's phone without mommy's permission. And you have to explain that at a young age because if they don't know, someone's gonna show them and they're gonna be curious. Another thing is, uh, is really just having these talks at a different age level and also programs in the schools that talk about this as well. Now we have, um, we have um, some movies that we put out. We have a movie for mothers in Hebrew and English and a movie for children. And we will, anybody who registered, we can send you the links to the movies. Um, and these are other ways to talk to your children about these topics. But you're right, these topics have to be talked about, but they can be talked about in appropriate ways. Yes, we have a problem of young teens or younger than that getting addicted to disgusting things on the internet. But first, let's talk to our kids about how to say no to these things, how to walk away from these things. And one of the things we say to the kids is, you know, it could be all of your friends want to walk away as well, but they don't have the courage that you do. And if you walk away, they'll probably follow you. Teach them how to stand up for things that, that are really important. I have a question. Yes. Yes. One of the safety rules is run and tell your mommy and daddy if you have a queasy feeling in your stomach. Right. If the mother or the father is the perpetrator, who should they go to and what do we do? Okay, so what we do is we tell them, tell your mommy and daddy. And we also stress, who are the other good adults in your life? So that if they can't tell their mommy and daddy, or if their mommy and daddy are problematic, who else can you talk to? Is it the teacher? Is your best friend's mommy? Is it your aunt? Is it your bubby? So certainly we teach children that they have a circle of people who they can turn to and help you go over and over again <clears throat> in that circle of people. I mean, you are going to tell them they can come to you because you know yourself as a mommy. But you can also say if mommy is not around, who else can you turn to? Debbie? Yeah. What about in Israel, in the Yishuvim, where there is a lot of going in and out, it's very accepted to go in and out of people's houses, and it's also very acceptable to take, to hitchhike, to go tramping. Um, and, and so how would you approach that when I know everybody else is doing it. And also there's this feeling like a, a mini kibbutz feeling. Okay, so first of all, there's that feeling because we allow that feeling. Okay, if we're gonna talk about tramping about hitchhiking, hitchhiking began because nobody was using the bus service. So then they had less and less buses come in and therefore people couldn't get out without the hitchhiking. So we have to, first of all, think, do we wanna provide um, minivans that, that go out more often. These are decisions that communities have to make. As far as going in and out, yes, you have to teach your child. You don't go to your best friend without your mommy's permission. And we have to really stress that. And kids can learn this. And if we as a community decide to make rules, in other words, let's say Yossi shows up my house. The first thing I say to Yossi is, does your mommy know you're here? then the first thing you have to do, Yessie, is call your mommy. Because one of the first rules we have is we always ask our mommy's permission. So if Yessie shows up at my house, that's what we do. As far as the hitchhiking, um, for years, my kids knew that I didn't stop at the Trempiata where people would wait to get rides. And they would say, well, they're standing in the rain. But I said, nobody's going to learn in my car that there are good rides. Because if they learn in my cars they're good rides, they'll get into another car. So we have to really 
this is community, community action. This is parents getting together in a community and saying, okay, these are our issues. How do we make it safer for our children? But even the example, when the kid shows up at your house, did you call your mommy? You know, they used to be, if you remember about 15, 20 years ago, there were these slogans, do you know where your child is, right? Okay, now we have to do the opposite. Do you know where your child is? Did your child ask your permission to be there? Debbie? Yeah. Hi. Um, so thank you very much for a really informative talk. Um, you've spoken about prevention. Um, what about when you have a situation um, I think this is like a lot of the, the problem was people were worried um, that they weren't going to be believed, so they didn't approach anyone. Um, and also, really, we need training for Rabonim and people in positions of, of uh, authority, you know, of what the right thing to do is. I mean, well, so here tonight, you have three organizations that you can turn to. Okay, you have Pathway, you have the Helpline, you have Tahel. You can turn if somebody has knows of an abuse, if somebody's being abused, you can turn to these places and we will listen. And the second thing is if you need training, you can turn to us and we will find ways to do the training, especially now that there's Zoom. I mean, we're just doing training all over the world. So what we have to do is not give up. What we have to do is decide we are taking back our community. And Would you so encourage people to go to the police? Because if someone's been abusing, then they are at risk of abusing other children. And if the somebody only is way abusing, to deal with this... they, will, they will continue to abuse. Correct. But I'm not going to answer your question about should they go to the police or not, because every situation has to be really thought out what is the best way to handle it. And that's why they have to turn to organizations that know and have experience in this. And then we can sit with them and help them decide what you can do. What is the best way to handle it? Because let's say um, it's a little child and they don't believe the police will handle them. That's not. So what is the best way to do it? So yes, we need training within our communities. We need watch Take your guard pillow. communities. And we also need to... No, Take your blanket, victims, please. The victims need to know that they can come, they can call anonymously and they can get help and their voice can be heard. And that's the first step. I mean, I would encourage personally people to go to the police because um, I think they're the ones who legally, you know, you don't want to have a situation where someone takes all this on themselves. You're totally right. But sometimes there are cases where there's already the law of, um, how do you say in, in, in English, um, where you, it's no longer, the time period is gone and the police can't deal with it anymore. Or if it's a case where the victim will be in danger. So that's why I'm saying you have to really, the victims have to come forward to people in a safe way and then decide what is the best way to, to obviously, if somebody did it, they will do it again. So just telling them no, 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 isn't the answer. But uh, on one foot, I'm not going to say there is one right answer. There are many ways of handling it. What, what do you mean the child will be in danger if they go to the police? Sometimes, uh, you know, they could be in danger from the perpetrator. So it depends really on the situation. And that's why it's so important with each case that professionals be involved in, and help them make the right decision. Debbie, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, regarding the Chaim Mulder case in Israel, um, if your kids don't know about it, should you speak to them about it? So again, I, I think it depends on their age. Uh, because about 10 or 11 years old. So, so 10 and 11, they will hear about it. If they oh, don't hear no. about it now, they'll hear about it next year. So somehow you have to perhaps open up the conversation with them because you'd rather them hear it from you in the right way than hear it from a friend in the wrong way. So, um, you know, broaching it gently that you, that unfortunately there were problems, et cetera, you know, depending on the child and how you want to talk about it. But, 
you know, well, if your child is very innocent and come in and you feel it's not the right age, then you won't talk about it. But being aware when it is the right age. So, Thank you. So they don't, I mean, the worst thing is when our children learn things from friends and they learn things often in a way that isn't appropriate or isn't even true, or they hear stories that aren't even true. So mm -hmm. I would rather they hear it from us in a gentle way, not the whole picture, not the whole story. What is necessary for them is what they have to learn. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. I've taught, I've like oh, had this open discussion with my kids and like whenever there's been any talk of, um, you know, safety with the body and how, to, you know, then there's, this at this like after a fat you know this afterwards for like a few days of them joking about it and it's like and i don't like it like they're joking about it in a way because i guess for them they don't know like the severity they, they, of it they, okay, but they joked about it but it went in they heard it so that's okay i guess i mean i you know i'm just imagining you know these people who do this they're power there's like they're stronger than than children or like even if it's um someone who's a few years older than them five years older than them, whatever it is that the people who are doing it to children are stronger so you know or they have they have their way of being able to 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 do what they're doing so um okay but usually it's a grooming process Usually they will do something little and see how the child reacts and then something else and see how the child reacts. And if the child reacts strongly to that little thing, they usually will choose someone else. Or if the child comes home and tells you about that little thing. So having these talks are important. And even if the kids giggle or make fun of them a little, it went in, they heard it. And that, and that will allow them to use the skills later on. Um, Part of this is really trusting your ability to be a mother and a father. You're wonderful parents. You know your children. Now you're just going to add some more to the way you talk to them, add some more to the chinuch that you're giving them. That's all. Can, can, I, can I just ask, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a big concern that people, uh, their first port of call is go to the rabbis. Now there's unfortunately been historically um, evidence of rabbis, um, you know, pushing things under the carpet. And also a lot of these rabbis aren't trained to deal with this stuff. So what would you tell you know, people who, who their automatic instinct is to go to the rabbi? Okay, so first of all, um, we've trained hundreds of rabbis and we would be happy to train more. Um, second of all, um, if somebody goes to a rub and they feel it isn't being handled, there are other people go to some of these organizations and tell them you're concerned, okay? There's never one answer. So if you've turned to someone and it didn't help or it was shushed up, then turn to someone else. That is the, that is the idea. The idea is that we keep talking until somebody doesn't shush it up. Question please. Yes. Yes. Hi, thank you. So thank you very much for this presentation and for all the work you've been doing for so many years. I remember you when you started out. Um, and um, the question is, if there is a grandfather who has had an ancestral incest, an ancestral relationship in the past. So now the grandchild, the, the parent doesn't want the child to be um, to be, um, you know, to not know his grandparent at all. Obviously, there's going to be there would be uh, chaperones in the presence of the grandfather. But the question is whether it's safe bichlal, for the grandchild to be um, to get to know the grandfather or if he has to be estranged. So I think that's a case where, you know, to speak to a professional about that particular case, because it depends on the grandfather, depends on the child. But certainly the grandfather cannot be alone with the child, cannot put the child on his lap, the, right. um, should not sleep over etc like that and I think that's really a case of what we call it is building a relapse prevention program building a program so that that he doesn't fall again right okay and the whole idea of a relapse prevention program is you build one home run another home run another home run so that a person doesn't fall again 
and it's it's for the benefit of both sides that way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Debbie, is it, we're, asking, we're getting asked a lot about how to address our kids regarding Chaim Walder. Those who do know, many of the kids have read the books. Um, how do we speak to our kids, age appropriate? How, is it, how does it work? Okay, so kids who have heard the story and how do we approach them? And I would really say that unfortunately, um, unfortunately, this person did a lot of things that were problematic. And therefore, because of that, um, you're hearing all these stories. And what's important for you to know is that you have skills to protect yourself. And what's important for you to know is there are still good people in the world. But we're going to take the books off the shelves because we don't want to read books from someone who did things that were not appropriate or that were not right. You know, it doesn't have to be a long, and then as the child asks questions, you can deal with it more. Um, look at if anybody is asking, are the stories true? I accompanied many of the victims, the stories are true, okay? So we're not doubting whether the stories are true. What we're trying to decide is what is the age appropriate way to talk to our children about it. So if an eight-year-old comes home and says, um, I heard they're taking all the books out of the store, what did he do? All you have to do is say, he, want, he did things that weren't nice, he did things that weren't appropriate, he didn't, and the children, and he did things that weren't nice and weren't appropriate to different people, and that's why we don't want his books in the house. They ask what you can say, I don't know the exact details. I just know that he did things that weren't appropriate and weren't right. If your child needs more, and you know your child, if you feel your child needs more, depending on their, as I said, 12 year olds, 15 year olds, I think you have to really use the abuse word. I think you have to say there was abuse involved because they're at a different level. But an eight year old, often you can just say that, or you can even say, he just did things that weren't good. And if the child says, what kind of things? What's important for you to know is there are good people and that you have good skills that you use and take with you everywhere. Um, but I think the first step before we talk to our kids is to deal with our emotions about all of this and to come to terms with our emotions. And then when we're feeling calmer with it, it will go easier with our children as we have the talks. Can I ask something? Yeah. Yeah, um, I know you're basically um, speaking about abuse, but I've got here a, a bit of a mixed message. The children are speaking also about the suicide part, and they're very mixed up. Like, being not near for somebody means that then you, you commit suicide. I, I don't know how to approach all that area. Are you discussing it at all, or you're not talking about that at all? Well, look, if the children know about the suicide, then and they're bringing it up, then you want them to bring it up to you and not to their friends, right? So you're going to have to say... You know, suicide is not an option. It doesn't solve problems. It even is talked about a lot in halakha, how problematic it is. And, you know, we're sorry this is what he did. We're sorry he felt he had to kill himself. We're really sorry about that. But it isn't something that should have been done. It was a wrong way to handle things. And I think we have to stress that. Suicide is always the wrong way to handle things. It's wrong ethically, it's wrong morally, it's wrong halachically. And we have to stress that. Can I go Thank back you. to your previous um, You know, also this, um, I will say that this, um, the business of Chilol Hashem by talking about it, etc. I have to say, did you notice that that is only used in cases of abuse? If... Um, somebody is selling non-kosher meat in a store that has a very good heksher. No rub comes out and says it's lush and horror to, to le farsame, to publicize that, right? Or if somebody does something else, no rub comes out and says it's lush and horror to talk about that. It's only in this issue. Okay, that will change. It will change as our society deals with the issue a little better. But certainly the message has to be Suicide is never an option. It doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter what was said. Suicide is never an option. And I think that's a very clear statement. It's not an option physically. It's not an option halakhically. It's not an option ethically. It's not an option Jewishly. Suicide is never an option. 
and nobody pushes you to do suicide. It's a choice that you make. I wanted to ask something about what you just said before about telling the children when they're so young you know, that he did something appropriate. So I don't have little ones in the house, but I can just see if I would have had to say that to a child, them being like more and more curious and more and more like not wanting, wanting to know the deal, but not necessarily asking you because you just said it was inappropriate and then going to school and let, listening to everybody else. That, that's why I'm saying, say. that's why I'm saying Tamar, you trust your motherhood. Okay, you trust, you know your child, you trust your motherhood and you will decide the right way I can't tell anybody here how to be the best mother or the best father. Halavai, I should have been the best mother or the best father. But what you can do is take your good motherhood skills with some of the things we talked about and decide how much to talk to and how much not to. And if you feel the child is still curious, then you will go one more step. And if they're still curious, you'll go one more step. But if they're not, if they've stopped at this, they got their answer and they want to go back to their play with their figurines, that's fine too. In other words, we have to feel out the child. And what about when they ask, like, why, what happened to him after he died, after he killed himself? Where's his neshama? They all, everybody loved, loved him. And I, 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 <laughs> I what are we going to tell them? His neshama went to Gehenna? What, what are we going to tell them? These are really good questions. And they're really hard questions. And they're questions that are hitting all of us, okay? The only thing I can think of is to say, like, I'm letting Hashem deal with it. It's beyond us. Yeah, you can say that. You could say, I don't know. I do know that Hashem will deal with everything in the right way. I do know that Hashem knows the answers to everything. And you and I don't know. All we know is we have to do our mitzvahs. We have to keep our safeguarding skills. And we have to try to be good Jews in a good community. That's all we know. And certain things we leave in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's hands. But I remind people that we've been for over an hour on the phone and we're starting to pay after 60 minutes. So they should call again, put down a call again. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I know that this is um, obviously a talk about educating your children and I love everything you've said so far, but as an adult and a parent, I find it quite hard um, again, I'm very, um, I'm not educated at all in this department. I find it kind of hard to understand the kind of mindset of abusers, whether it be pedophiles or rapists or whatever level of abuse. Is it something a normal healthy man would just wake up one day and want to do? Is it there's like kind of, I don't know, prerequisites to turning into it? I, you know, like I understand not giving, giving your child the impression that they should be suspicious and everyone might be bad. But as an adult, I find myself wondering is it any any person on the street is it specific types of people you know every other year a story like this comes out and it's like com I find it confusing as an adult as well basically so do you have any thing to say on that I find it confusing as well after 40 years I still don't get it I still don't get it how a nice from man could do these things no it's confusing the only thing is what you're asking is it every man in the street no no, it's not. Our husbands and our brothers and our sons and our neighbors, they're good people. And they're living good lives and they're following the Torah way of living. And that is going to protect all of us and build our communities. But there are some people who are born with problems. There are some people who are abused as little boys. And then they go out when they're older and abused because they didn't get help. There are little boys or young teenage boys that get addicted to the disgusting things on the internet and that makes them do things. There are many reasons that people do these things, but it is not your typical person in the street. Yes, we hear of so many cases, but those cases are usually done by a small amount of people. Most of the people are good, okay? And because we can't know who is good, we have to have safety skills. Is it hard to deal with? Yes. It's really hard to deal with. It's really hard to think that people in our community could, could be so disgusting. Yeah, it is. It's really hard. But I do think we can stop the epidemic. I don't think they did such a great job of stopping the COVID-19, but you and I can do a better job at stopping the epidemic of child abuse. We can stop it.
we can stop it, all of us, we really can. We can decide to make our community safe. We can stand up for the victims. We can stand up against the abusers once it's proven they're abusers. We can make changes in our community. We can do education. We can have protocols. We have tuck and knowns. We can do all of these things and make our communities safe. Not only can we, but this is now our must. Once this has been opened up, we no longer can sit quietly in our homes and say, okay, someone else will take care of it. Nobody else is taking care of it. Tonight, all of you are part of the battle. So are you saying that by us kind of making a stand against it and making our children feel safe to come tell us that almost like the abusers are sort of like parasites and if they don't have anything to feed on, they just disappear or they're always going to kind of be around? Well, there's two things. Either they can, there's two things. Either they will move to different communities where they can get away with it or some of them will go get help because they don't want to get caught or some of them will find a way to, if they've just begun to stop it. I mean, when it's easy, you continue to do something. When it's harder, then you have to think twice about stopping. And we have to also have train from therapists who can deal with abusers so that young men can go get help when they've done it once and they want to stop. Thank you. Debbie? Sorry, yes. another question. Should the discussion of like teaching the kids about the three rules and the magic pocket and secrets and always asking permission, should that be done as a group discussion? If your kids are all similar ages so that they can feed off each other, or is it better to do it one-to-one? -one? It really depends what works for your kids. It really does. You know, I mean, like, you know, if the kids are, um, if the kids are in a swimming pool, so you could say, you know, you can decide to talk about you know, as a group, um, the bathing suit covers your private parts and let's all remember that. It depends on the kids and the situation. There isn't one rule, but obviously you're gonna to talk to different kids at different age levels differently. Um, I did a, a grandma day camp before the corona where all my grandchildren came and they were all different ages and we did a workshop together and it was really good. And all the kids came home and told their mommies and daddies that they had a workshop on safeguarding and it was just part of the day camp, that was all. So um, it can be done in a group, it can be done fun, it can be done very lightly. It doesn't have to be a heavy, serious discussion. The heaviest serious discussion is if they come to you now in pain or upset because of what they've heard. Great, thank you. Debbie? Yes. Um, hi, thank you very much. Is there, is there a profile of a child who's more likely to be abused? Like it's the opposite of, of the other lady's question um, than another child. Like are there, are there children that have more propensity to be abused? You know, first of all, um, children who have been abused are more vulnerable to being abused again because they're, they sort of lost their skills to identify who's good and who isn't good. Um, children whose parents don't know where they are and who don't have to have parental permission are more of a chance. Children who are loners and don't have groups of friends have more of a chance. So all of these things um, can, take, uh, can certainly profile that child. Um, but also thinking twice, wherever you're sending your child to some club or to some lesson or things like that, whether an adult woman doesn't have to be present there also. And, and then the other question I had is, it's very difficult to be a lone voice in a community. So you were saying, you know, let's create safe communities. But if you, the, that lone voice, first of all, the, the victims of some, you know, someone like Chaim Walder who, when too many people until they were heard, you have to be extremely strong when, you, when you're being subjected to abuse to have the koyach to stand up for yourself. Yes, that's why what we have to do is create a community that doesn't allow abuse. In other words, what we have to do is create a community where we allow voices of the victims to come forward, to create a community where we have things put in place so that it is really hard to abuse our children. And um, 
nobody here is alone now because this has come out and this is being talked about. This is a way to build together and change things. Like, I mean, my, my, my children are in high school and they're girls and the, they were going, the, the, the principal, who's very conscious about these things, made a lesson that the five girls would go to a male teacher's home, a single male teacher's home. I was the only parent who said, this can't happen. Have the class in my house. But you can't send, even if it's a group of girls, to somebody, to a single man's home for a lesson. Okay, so there are lots of situations where we have to look at them and decide what is appropriate and what isn't. And then even if we're not sure, voice that unsureness. So you're right. We have to voice that insurance. And um, today, a lot of communities are, in Israel are building what they call a Badat Muganut, a safeguarding committee. So they're in charge in the, in the community to see what isn't working and what isn't going, and they're trained. And so thinking how all these things can be put into effect. I think the purpose of tonight is, first of all, for you to take time to to deal with your emotions concerning all of this, because we all have emotions concerning this. The second thing is to allow space for your children to deal with their emotions. The third thing is to talk to your children about safeguarding. And the fourth thing is to make sure that your community is not going to forget this affair in a month and go back to start Pesach cleaning, but that in a month your community is moving forward towards building a safer community for your children. And as I said, there are organizations that can help you. Can we reach Tonight? out to you? Is there any way we can reach out to you? Yeah, yeah, certainly. You have the Tahel, to, in order to sign up, you have the Tahel um, address. And also our number is um, in Israel is star 2511. And you have in Manchester the helpline, and you have Pathways, and in London you have um, Shmakoli. So there are organizations existing all over that you can turn to and get help. Thank you very much. I just, I think, if you don't mind, um, I, uh, I was just thinking like there's so much support with all forms of mental health issues around the world, but any, you know, this is a sickness that, that, you know, it grows. And if some, if it's not treated, or if it's not like, you know, somebody doesn't, you know, can try to control their impulses, whatever it is, I don't know how a person um, lives with it and doesn't react on it. But um, anyways, like what we're talking about helping the victims, but what about like trying to give some source of help to these people who are sick because no, that's why i said we have to make sure we have trained from therapists so that they can go get help that's exactly one of the things that um is important yes and we also have to allow young boys who are unsure but not, but not just that that i'm sure that there's help available but these people who do it maybe they don't even realize that they they're probably I can't even imagine that somebody would do that they probably have so much shame going on in their minds and so you know it's like a it's a it's a sickness that goes on in their minds that they're just going to continue to do it again because they can't figure out how to how to live so, another way but if we as a community identify them and help them get help then we can stop the cycle there's but lots of might say something. I don't know. Or they should they, identify themselves. They, they, it's like they somebody don't want has to. They manic don't, they depression. Want to well, I mean, I'm going to stop it. Let me just tell you, we can't solve all the problems in one Zoom. Okay? We're bringing up some of the issues. Some of the issues is our communities need to be safer. Some of the issues our children need to learn safeguarding. Some of the issues is we have to allow victims to come forward in a safe way. We have to take their voices seriously, and we have to find a way to help young perpetrators get help so that they don't become um, big abusers like we just saw. So there are many aspects, and each of us can choose which aspect we want to get involved in, so that if we're all getting involved in all these different aspects, then we can really make that change. And finally, the finally thing is... Um, 
you don't have to do everything. You just have to do one step. Okay. Um, what is the pasuk? Um, um, lo. Lo alecham lecham. Nacham. Lo alecham lecham We don't have to do. I mean, somebody said she remembers when I just started. Uh, Miriam said when I just started to. Have, we were actually three women in a kitchen. Okay, and. So get together with two women in your kitchen and talk about how you're going to make your neighborhood safer. That's all. That's all you have to do. My message to you tonight is take two friends, have a cup of coffee in the kitchen and talk about how you're going to make your neighborhood safer. And 30 years from now, you might have an organization. Okay. Anyway, you should all really just take all of this in a way that will help you trust that you're an amazing mother trust that you're an amazing father and that you live in a great community and a kaddish baruch Hu just really should give us all the strength to wipe this out so that we can only have chesed in our communities